To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, visit GoStudyHall.com or click the link in the description. Whether you're a proud Sun Devil, a member of the Beehive, or a Trekkie, the cultural groups we're a part of are an important part of our identities. And yes, the Star Trek fandom is a cultural group. We feel united with these other people in these groups to seek out new life, uh, new civilizations, and to boldly go where no man has gone before, or, you know, whatever. But fandoms aren't the only kind of shared identity. We have crucial national identities too, and as a nation, we're united through shared language, culture, and international political identity. In a lot of ways, this feeling of nationalism is great because we're humans and we love to feel included. But it's not always so straightforward. Like, what if you like Spock and Luke Skywalker? Or what if your national identity actually doesn't line up with the country you live in? Now, a little vocab lesson here, because in common English, we tend to use the words nation and country pretty interchangeably. Nations are groups of people knit together by common culture and shared history, while countries can be nations, but aren't always. A country is just a political entity with its own government and borders, and often, in government's quest for power, a lot of nations can end up lumped together as part of one country. And that's just where things start to get messy. Hi, I'm Rob Fuller, and this is Study Hall, Modern World History. Prior to the 18th century, nation-states, or countries with borders that match their national identities, weren't really a thing. It was all about empires, which were huge groups of conquered states, all under a single umbrella of authority. And oftentimes, the people in those empires had very little in common with their ruler or with one another. Imagine you're living in France in the year 1600. Oui, oui, très bien, un autre crepe, s'il vous plaît. Even though you're part of the French monarchy, you might not have a whole lot in common with your fellow French subjects. Sure, you might speak French, but you may also speak Breton or Provincial. And when it comes to food, it's also about where you live. Like, if you're in the eastern provinces, your diet has probably more of a sausages and spätzle vibe. But if you're in the south, near the Mediterranean, there's a lot less sauerkraut and a lot more seafood, including bouillabaisse, the famous fish stew out of Marseille. Also, you're probably Catholic, but you could be Protestant or Jewish. Basically, the only thing that makes you French is that some guy conquered your town, and now you're ruled by the French king. But then things started to change. French rulers like Cardinal Richelieu enforced policies to emphasize national unity as a way to reduce the chances of messy rebellions. Richelieu also established the French Academy in 1635, which was tasked with compiling the very first standard French dictionary. And the French Revolution took these ideas and really focused in on the idea of a nation of people supported and reflected by their government. Sometimes, this process of building a nation meant finding out what people did have in common. Not everyone was eating fish stew or spätzle, but overall the French did love their cheese and wine, so those became part of French cuisine and national identity. But other times, it meant that people actually had to change to fit in. And so the languages of Breton and Provençal were banned, more than once actually, and everyone who went to school had to learn academic French. Nationalism may have started in France, but it exploded across Europe in the aftermath of the French Revolution at the end of the 18th century. Public education helped standardize the knowledge and values of citizens, and groups like the Young Italy movement developed to celebrate their national identities and create governments based on those identities. The nationalism mania of the 19th century was a problem for huge empires like the Ottomans, whose power encompassed tons of different people and cultures. In the 1300s, the Ottoman Empire was ruled by Muslims, but their empire included also Christians, Jews, and people of other faiths. Not only that, but the ruling dynasty, the Ottoman Turks, weren't even originally from the area. They had migrated centuries earlier, and their language and culture were very different from those around them. Things really started to go downhill for the Ottomans in the 1820s with the Greek War of Independence. Like Italy and Poland, the Greeks wanted a nation based on their own identity. They spoke Greek, not Turkish or Arabic, and they were Christian, and they wanted a Christian ruler. 
Also, maybe they wanted some tzatziki with their heroes and not tahini. And because Europe and the Ottomans had beef going all the way back to the 1400s, countries like Great Britain, France, and Russia were all too eager to support the Greeks. Uh, they jumped right into the drama, spreading anti-Ottoman propaganda across the continent. And when the Ottomans were defeated in 1829, it wasn't just a victory for the Greeks, but for the idea of nationalism as a whole. One after another, nations in the European part of the Ottoman Empire began to break away. Supported by rival European empires like Russia and Habsburg-ruled Austria-Hungary, who hoped to take over these fledgling nation-states themselves. And these tensions really came to a head in the region known as the Balkans. The Balkans had historically been ruled by the Habsburgs and the Ottomans. As the Ottoman Empire declined, a lot of new countries popped up in this region, including Greece. Greece, Serbia, and Bulgaria. But it wasn't as easy as just updating the map. See, the countries of Greece, Serbia, and Bulgaria may have been new, but as cultural nations, the peoples of these regions had long histories. Histories that often included taking over one another, with one nation controlling the other at various points in history. It was a little like how diehard Star Wars fans know that Han Solo shot first, even if George Lucas went back later to change the scene. But just like Han both did and did not shoot first, depending on which version of the film you're watching, all these separate nations were part of one another at different points in history. For example, way, way back in the 3rd century BCE, Alexander the Great conquered pretty much the entire Balkans region, meaning that it was all part of Greece. But fast forward a hot 13 centuries, and suddenly Bulgaria controlled all of this territory, including Serbia. But then three centuries after that, in the 1300s, it was Serbia that controlled Bulgaria. So what's a nation to do? Well, one answer was just to ignore historical borders and say, if Serbian people live here, it's Serbia. If Greek people live here, it's Greece. But there were two problems with that solution. First, because they all lived together under Ottoman rule, many people moved to different places. So Greek people lived with Bulgarians, who lived with Serbians, who lived with other Greeks. This made drawing boundaries harder. The second problem with nationalism is that it framed independence as a fight for one's homeland. So no one wanted to come back from war and find out that their homeland was suddenly half or a quarter of the size that it used to be. This was especially true when it meant giving up national heritage sites, or places that have cultural and historical significance to a nation, like the Ryla Monastery in Bulgaria. Oftentimes, multiple nations will claim the same site as their own, which leads to tension. And no, not the kind that can be undone with 15 minutes of mindfulness and a good shoulder massage. And these tensions came to a head in 1908 because of two important events. First, there was a revolution. From 1874 to 1876, the Ottoman Empire worked under a constitution in the effort to modernize the empire. The constitution established a parliament, reformed the military, the bureaucracy, and the tax code, and defined people's legal rights as citizens. It was a big deal, the result of over 30 years of reforms. But then the Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, suspended the constitution and began to rule without any restraints on his power? Think no to parliament and human rights, and yes to secret police and censorship. By 1908, people had had enough, and a group known as the Young Turks led a revolt against the Sultan. Now, unlike Young Italy, the Young Turks did not begin as a nationalist movement. The Young Turks included Turks, but also Greeks, Armenians, and other groups. The group was united in wanting a modern state, which meant having a constitution and not an all-powerful sultan. But after the success of the revolution, the Young Turks began to promote an increasingly Turkish national identity and excluded everyone else. They made Turkish the official language, limited the number of Armenians who could serve in the government, and restricted the rights of non-Turks. And there were a lot of non-Turks still living in the Ottoman Empire. Like, if you kicked out the Trekkies at a sci-fi convention just because they'd rather live long and prosper, and you'd rather use the force. Meanwhile, neighboring Austria-Hungary worried that the new Turkish-Ottoman government would try to take back the region of Bosnia-Herzegovina. 
Austria-Hungary had been given temporary control of the region earlier, much to the chagrin of the Bosnians, and they didn't really want to give it back. So here we are. We've got a bunch of new countries all arguing over who should get what territory. We've got the newly nationalistic Ottoman Empire trying to oppress all the non-Turkish folks, and we have Austria-Hungary taking over territory that didn't want to be taken over. Q global violence. In 1912, a group of these new Balkan countries attacked the Ottoman Empire to force them out of Europe and free neighboring countries like Albania, Macedonia, and Montenegro in the First Balkan War. The Balkan countries defeated the Ottoman Empire, but this victory quickly turned into a disaster as the winners then began to fight amongst themselves for territory. So the First Balkan War quickly turned into the Second Balkan War. Importantly, the Serbian nationalist group, the Black Hand, plotted a series of attacks on Austria-Hungary because of their theft of the Bosnia-Herzegovina region. Although closely tied to the Serbian government, this group wasn't strong enough to declare full-on war with Austria-Hungary, but instead launched a series of terrorist attacks. And one of these attacks was successful, not only at hitting the target, but at shaking up the political landscape of all of Europe. On June 28, 1914, in the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Serbian nationalist Gavrilo Princip assassinated the heir to the Austrian throne, Franz Ferdinand the Archduke, not the rock band. In this moment, the series of conflicts and wars that had torn apart the Ottoman Empire and splintered the Balkans quickly turned into the First World War, swallowing all of Europe in a conflict over national pride and power. And that previously inclusive Ottoman Empire? Well, throughout World War I, they systematically captured and killed over a million Armenians. Before World War I, there were estimated to be over one million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, and by 1918, there were virtually none. In the aftermath of the war, it was clear that a new system of order was necessary. Nationalism birthed new countries across Europe with strong national identities, but it also caused wars and destruction. There had to be a way to both celebrate the individuality and autonomy of the nations, while also preventing them from coming to blows over national borders. To help nations work together and prevent future violence, the Covenant of the League of Nations was drafted in 1919 as part of a peace negotiations at the end of the war. The League of Nations was the first ever intergovernmental organization created to promote peace and collaboration between separate nations across the globe. And while, spoiler alert, it wasn't totally successful, it did pave the way for the creation of the United Nations, which still exists today. The rise of nationalism in Europe drew people together in many ways, uniting citizens under a national identity of shared language, cuisine, history, and religion. But in the fight for national identity, it became clear nationalism could also inspire violence, xenophobia, and even genocide. World War I saw the beginning of a reckoning over the dangers of nationalism not just in the Balkans, but across all of Europe. The League of Nations was one of the first attempts to unite disparate groups of people, not beneath one empire, but as a collaborative team of separate countries in an effort to preserve both national identity as well as the peace within nationalist Europe. But the idea of nationalism was not so easily tamed. Dictators like Hitler and Mussolini would go on to rally support based on nationalist values taken to the extreme. And while many thought World War I and the Armenian Genocide showed the world the worst dangers of extreme nationalism, others see them as the precursors to World War II and an even larger genocide, the Holocaust. If you're enjoying Study Hall Modern World History and are interested in taking online courses and earning college credit, visit GoStudyHall.com or click on this button to learn more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.